Hello and welcome again to yet another Trina Community Broadcast. Today, on this 19th of August, we are in episode, I don't even know what, like we're close to getting five, I think. Right? <laughs> yeah, we're on the 24th episode now. And Come that on. is my co-host, Brian. Hey, welcome. Hey. We are again talking about Trino, SQL, Data Mesh, Big Data. And today, we're also going to talk about deploying this stuff in what everyone uses, and that is Kubernetes. So we'll we'll hopefully learn a bit about this. Me and Brian are going to riff off each other and see what we know and don't know. And <laughs> maybe some of you can join in and jump in and uh, throw us your questions. But hopefully, at the end of it, we'll know a lot about more about Kubernetes and how this all relates to Trino. So it should be a great show. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, this this has been something I've wanted to do for a while, um, and uh, I think it'll be a, a pretty cool episode. That you know, I, I'm I'm still in this whole process. I think a lot of, of engineers, you know, like there's too many things to learn out there. Um, I, I I heard about Kubernetes back whenever it was first getting really hot. I don't know, 2016 or so was when I started kind of hearing it. You know. Murmur yeah, funny it. side funny side effect. The 1.0 release came out at OSCON. Yeah, uh, 2015, and okay. I was actually presenting on that conference. Oh, <laughs> nice! Yeah, at the launch. So. You're such a veteran. I feel like such a noob compared to, <laughs> compared to you, man. But it's ridiculous. I'm just old. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nice way of saying old is veteran. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so like I, I, I started hearing murmurs about it, you know, and I've like always been like, oh, that's something I should learn about at some point. It's going to be useful for my, you know, like knowing how to actually get things out. At the time, you know, it was like still all about Docker. And I was like, yeah, I'll just keep working, you know, working with Docker stuff and maybe that'll take off. And, you know, there's Docker Swarm, right? And so, yeah. and then, uh, and then, you know, it kept going. And each year I was like, okay, and I definitely, I think I, I, 2017 or 2018, I bought a Udemy course for it, and then I just never took it, and, and so yeah, it's, it's a bit like Kubernetes is amazing. It's a bit like uh, like it was for used for for ages in within Google, right? It wasn't yeah. even called uh, Kubernetes. Then they open sourced it, and there were all these competitors like Apache Mesos and Docker yeah. Swarm, and it literally was like a like a domino parade of Meeting. all of those competitors falling over. Yeah, so. it was. It was. I think it was what like a matter of like a, a year that those things started to come around it, and it just kept continued like staying on top. It just the community. I think that was also a testament to like the the community like uh, growth around it and and getting people just up and running on it as quickly as possible because it's not an easy technology to to really get people effective on. And you know they that's where I think like a lot of the success came. And was like really getting a lot of the intro and the, the materials around how to actually use it. Um, it's still a complicated thing, and that's what we're going to be talking about here today. But before we jump into that, I wanted to share a silly like freaking story that yeah, I, yeah, I've been I've been uh uh like so as you can tell, I don't have the cool background like Manfred, and my lighting's uh not as is is not actually too bad in here. But uh, I've been uh in the middle of a move, and so I keep like. I keep setting up these private uh, conference places and trying to get like all of my streaming gear hauled in every sing every two weeks right now, just so that I can have a better mic. So today I drove in um, and uh, got my stuff hauled into the bottom of the building. The, I, I'm at a WeWork office right now, so like. I had the people from WeWork uh, come down to meet me and I'm unloading my stuff from my car and I realized my green, my whole box that has like my green screen and all the lights and stuff is just missing. And I go, <laughs> what the heck? And I was like, <laughs> like an hour drive getting into the city and stuff. It's just cr crazy hustle bustle. And I get here and I'm like, well, this was a fun trial run. Uh, let me pull all this stuff back into my car and I'm going to go park. And I have to like just do this without uh, all my all my gear and my mic and everything. Because so it turns out my wife yesterday uh, took our dogs to get groomed and she pulled the box out so that they, she could make room for the dogs to sit down. So Fair anyway, enough. Long story short, uh, here I am in, uh, in the, one of these little phone booths that have a pretty decent amount of lighting, and I'm actually going to see if this might just be my normal setup from now on. And I'm it just seems gonna... to be working all right. You're looking good as always. Yeah. And I think it's a good. I can hear you well, so yeah, I think win, perfect. 
So we'll just stick with this and I'll keep my life simpler until I actually, uh, we, we did just close on a house. So we, we're, we're going to be moving in here in the next couple of weeks. So I, I will keep you all, well, I don't, I don't maybe have to keep you all updated, but if anybody's curious, let me know and I'll tell you whenever things are going well for me. <laughs> Anyways, um, without further ado, let's, let's get a quick word from our sponsors before we jump right into the Kubernetes stuff from uh, Starburst. Uh. I'm Colleen Tarto. I am the Director of Engineering on Starburst Galaxy. What is it actually offering? So, I mean, I, I think this kind of like builds on some of the open source Trino stuff, but is it doing a lot more? Uh, what what kind of pains is it solving? Could you kind of uh, uh, give us a little bit of insight on, on what actual pain this is going to be uh, uh, alleviating? Yeah, absolutely. And so to, to think about that, I always like to go back and think about what's the difference between Starburst Enterprise and Trino, right? And so I always like to think of Starburst Enterprise as the cool older sibling to Trino. It's a little bit more mature, a little cooler. It's got a, it's got a car. It's got yeah. some cool stuff going on, leather jacket, you know. Um, and Trino is awesome in its own right, don't get me wrong, but Starburst Enterprise is just better and a bit more grown up. And specifically what that means to me is that with Enterprise, you get more. You get more functionality, faster performance, more connectors, more security, better management, better integration into the ecosystem of tools that you already use today, data governance, integration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But what really speaks volumes to me is that when you use Starburst Enterprise, you get Starburst, right? You get best-in-class support from the folks who work for us, and they know Trino best because they created Trino, and they're continuing to contribute to Trino. Um, But Starburst Galaxy takes that to a whole other level, right? So One of the pain points is installing, managing, maintaining, monitoring Starburst Enterprise. And so Starburst Galaxy alleviates all that, right? So it's um, a fully managed service. It's Starburst Enterprise as a managed service and more. And one last question. Is uh, there going to be any free offerings coming up anytime soon? Is that on the road? Absolutely. We're building out. We've got a free trial. Um, so if you're interested, absolutely reach out to us. We are very excited about it. Um, and then we're talking about sort of a free tier. So like being able to just play around with it in your own environment and see what's what. We'll keep you all uh, up to date on when you can start to play around with Galaxy and Trino uh, for free for just a little bit and uh, get to know this incredible service called Starburst Galaxy. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so Manfred, I, I, I think uh, everybody is patiently waiting for our, our next release. Uh, where, where are we at with 361? We, my team put out the call to get things ready. So there's a bunch of things in the pipeline. Okay. But I think it's not going to arrive until next week sometime, probably Fair later enough. next week. That's my guess at this stage. So we will talk at it in our episode 25. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll, one quick thing to look forward to. Uh, so in other news, you know, we we have this interesting uh, um, uh, uh, conversation that coming up with the some of the Debezium folks. So that'll be uh, in the next show. Uh, definitely check that out. If you're into the whole change data capture, you've heard about it. Uh, we're going to be kind of diving into that whole uh, design and uh, and kind of what it uh, affords, and then you know talk specifics about Debezium with uh, Gunnar. I don't know how to say his last name, so I'm just going to skip it for now. And but he he is one of the kind of like lead guys on the Red Hat team that do a lot of stuff with Debezium. So uh, really excited to get a chat with them in the next episode, and uh, and then we'll we'll dive into 361. Possibly 362. Who knows? <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. it's not gonna be 362, but, <laughs> you don't think but so? yeah, it's okay. great that we keep talking to other people and, and and like finding all these tools that work really really well with uh, our query engine. Thanks to other different clients, JDBC Driver, the, Twin, the Python client and stuff. It's really yeah. awesome to see all these use cases. So. Oh yeah, I mean, okay, I think so. I think one thing we want to do on the show more and more too is start exploring the outer ecosystem that kind of sits along with Trino because you know it, people that are are in our community are data engineers at the end of the day, and and so including like being able to do what we're doing today with Kubernetes, uh, the, the fuller ecosystem and understanding ingestion and real time and all these other bits that fall outside of Trino but are like kind of adjacent to Trino. I think is really important that we we take that into consideration as well, like 
a very common one with that we can now look at is that when we did it with dbt so that's definitely something we're, we're trying to aim for on this show but um one last yeah, little bit you, of news. Oh, related to that if you do have one of those use cases yourself out there and you want to be a guest feel free yeah. to reach us on slack and ping us and we'll we'll figure something out it should be awesome yeah, and if you're not on the Slack either, you know we have our our little Twitter handles here: Simple Agility and Bits on Data Dev. You can reach us out on the Twitter sphere if you know us there, and uh, or or on LinkedIn wherever you uh, wherever you know where, where we're at. <laughs> you can right. find us. So um, a quick bit of uh, um, of uh, information or a quick update on Trino Summit. So first, if you are not aware, there is a Trino Summit coming up uh, on October 21st. Um, and what uh, just came down the pipeline today, uh, we had been recently monitoring the whole um, uh, kind of COVID, Delta, Lambda type situations, uh, kind of bringing up uh, a lot of rise in, in the uh, area. We were we basically converted this into a hybrid event uh, when we first launched it. And, uh, and, you know, this was earlier on in the summer. Um, and then we, you know, obviously as things have been constantly changing, we have to kind of keep, keep our uh, ears to the floor on, on what's happening with, uh, with COVID. So we have just made the decision this morning uh, to go full on virtual for Trino Summit. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I mean, this is keeping us safe. It's a good move. And it's just considering all of the, uh, the rise of rates in, um, of COVID in, in California right now. Uh, we just, you know, we, we want to be more considerate of uh, everybody's safe and uh, safety and healthy health, and uh, also just, you know, making sure that we're not, you know, uh, 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 basically encouraging the spread of the virus uh, or, or making anything worse here. So, you know, I think this is a great move. Uh, we're going to be doing this full virtual, but, you know, we still have some incredible talks. Uh, we have EA that just joined us. Um, they're going to be talking about data, their uh, kind of in-house uh, SaaS solution to data governance. Are you uh, talking and, uh, EA as in uh, Electronic Arts? Yeah, Electronic Arts. The, oh, uh, sweet. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like a gaming gaming people. I, I always want to say... The oh, I love that game is, since forever. Like, it's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I always think of EA Sports, you know, <laughs> that, their sports branch. But uh, yeah, the, the EA, EA group, uh, they're they're doing a lot of cool stuff. So, so they'll be joining a, got a lot of newer faces that are are showing up and, and uh, uh, along with the well-known ones like you know we're gonna have Netflix and and LinkedIn there uh, talking about their some of their latest changes in architectures um, I think uh, Netflix has some cool stuff around caching that they're uh, that they do on with uh, SSDs so I'm really intrigued on that uh, and how they're kind of making this kind of interesting caching layer for for Trino so um, so definitely looking forward to a lot of cool talks and uh, I'm gonna be trying to spice it up uh, I'll be emceeing uh, and, and kind of be your your uh, hype man in between all of the talks so <laughs> uh, well, you so know, we... if you look at it like this way Trino Summit is essentially going to be an extension of the Trino community's uh, broadcast it's going to be just as awesome virtual yep. more speakers more audience more interaction it's gonna exactly. awesome. so that's pretty good yeah, we're looking at uh, in terms of interaction. You know, we we are thinking now that we're going full virtual. Why not just take in something like Gather Town and and we're, we'll look at some of those options. So if you go to the Trino Summit thing today, I'm I, I'm going to add these into the show notes. Uh, tri it's uh, uh, basically go to the, the landing page for Trino Summit. It still says virtually or in person. That's going to change here shortly. Uh, just sign up for virtual um, and uh, call for papers. By the way, it has uh, ended. That ended on August fifteenth. So uh, if you do want to still submit it, but it won't be able to be entered in uh we can just take it for maybe a, a meetup or maybe the next year's um potentially considering it for next year's summit um so uh so right now yeah there's a lot of information that needs to get updated on this page but in particular just to, if you want to sign up for that uh sign up for virtual it's going to be october 21st a lot of fun um and we'll look into more options in terms of making this a lot more kind of interactive and and kind of uh getting people to, to sit down and, and actually have face-to-face -face chats and things like that if if that's what you like to do at these things uh some people like to just you know learn and then leave but um uh every everybody to their to their own essentially yeah there's a whole bunch of uh, platforms now so we'll, we'll make sure we'll have, to have something happening where everyone can network and that kind of stuff as well totally well without further ado let's jump right into the kubernetes concept of the week i think i got it that time let me see mm. 
cool. All right. So uh, I think I, I felt like it flowed a little more that time. And I just got to get to the point where I stopped talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So so this concept of the week, we are talking about Kubernetes architecture, a little bit of containers, uh, what kind of motivated, you know, before we even had Kubernetes, what, what why do we need Kubernetes in the first place? So we, we're going to talk about containers first, uh, move into, you know, what's a pod, what's a cubulet, and, and all these other kind of pieces that sit around in the architecture of, of Kubernetes. So, um, so I'm just going to take a quick stab at this, and, and Manfred, you you correct me uh, uh, along the way, um, and or or add in little tidbits that I maybe forget about. So, sure. uh, so basically, if we look at this uh, this diagram, uh, if you're uh, this is going to be in the show notes. Uh, so, if you're on the podcast, definitely check out the show notes for this. We have uh, three kind of phases, I would say, that that, that got us to to containers. So, you know. We we started out uh, in the, in the in the olden days <laughs> of of uh, doing traditional deployments where you would just have some operating system like uh, you know Linux, Windows, and and uh, or Mac OS, uh, you know, and, or any kind of Unix system, and that would sit on top of some hardware, and that gave you some facilities to deploy these you know your applications. So, uh, let's say you know a Java application, or if you do something on C plus plus, you can pile it specifically to that like operating system and hardware piece, you know. Ultimately, you get your apps for the specific operating system for that hardware, and you can deploy multiple apps on on this operating system and this hardware. And you know, it it, it worked and everything like that. And and you know, essentially, one app maybe doesn't take all the resources of that operating system or hardware. So you do want to you know try to kind of make the best bang for your buck. So you deploy mul either multiple instances of the same application, or you are deploying different applications that maybe support each other. Uh, or, you know, back in even even further days before we were talking any of these kind of like microservice type architectures, you know, you you would typically have like maybe one or two giant applications that would kind of yeah. depend on each other, right? They and, kind yeah, of the typical thing then, and, and I think the important aspect about this is back then it was way more common to have this like one large legacy app that yeah. where you have like a lamp stack or like even like even like more like robust sort of like uh, like some application server plus some database server and the whole thing is all installed in one box and uh all, it does it all and the the important aspect from a from a like a developer perspective back then was well you needed to convince your ceo or whoever to buy that server and get that into a data center and months until that was called like was like provisioned and it'll cost like you know fifty hundred thousand dollars or way more right like to get anywhere right so yeah. it'll be like a long long haul and yeah. obviously that wasn't so great <laughs> yeah i mean that just delayed delayed things and you know I don't know waterfall processes going on. That was already a slow process to begin with. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, like uh, we we have uh, and and just so if I can remember, LAMP uh, stacks are Linux, uh, Apache. This is the uh, original MySQL one. and PHP, MySQL or MySQL and, and Perl, even if you go longer Ooh. back. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I did. I think I did one lamp stack in my in my day, and then like there was uh, a whole bunch of new things. Like I think I went immediately to Django right after that. Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, I, I think um, uh, that was that was interesting. I that was like my one little little pass into into that, and then like right when I started learning about it, it died. <laughs> so <laughs> or at least it became less popular. Yeah, there were a lot of other yeah. things like that, right? Like lots of people had things running on on windows or like on on like ibm with like web like web, like web the application service and all sorts of stuff but yeah so then you know so that was clearly not good right we want we needed to have a much more robust way to kind of get applications and another another downside to this before we hop right into the like virtualized uh, version of this is a we you also if, if you had one of these applications do something funky like maybe it crashed or did some weird thing like there was no way to stop any issue, like bad things that that application did when it crashed or did some funky thing. If it screwed up something in that operating system, all of those applications are sharing the same resources. And so if, if one app did, did something wrong, you know, or, or made something really bad in the environment, the other applications suffered from that. So you needed this kind of idea that okay, we need to have this way to not only deploy things faster, but we need to make sure that we kind of isolate all of these like ch issues or changes that happen between these applications up. Because if one app fails, that's, you know, 
maybe not the worst thing in the world, especially if we start to make you know, move to uh, what we're going to talk about here in a second, this microservices architecture where things are a lot more modularized. And so maybe if one app crashes, it's like, uh, you know, a back end call fails for a while when you when you uh, when you try to refresh your screen or something like that. But the whole website's not down. You know, essentially, it's just one one instance of that application. And, you know, it's it's not a big deal. But in this case, if that application does something maybe unintentionally nefarious. Just, you know, it starts, you know, Stealing all the memory, or, or try, or basically like, just uh, that data. Point. It's just, you know, like it's terrible to figure out what what actually makes something slow, oh, yeah. and when it goes down, the whole thing goes down. So, yep, all the other applications that are totally unrelated, you know, get, start going down. The only relation that they had is that they were deployed on the same operating system. So yeah. then we we move into okay, with this this newer paradigm that said, okay, this what if we just took this operating system and we put this little thing that's called the hypervisor that would run this concept called the virtual machine the virtual machine is going to be this thing that has its that runs uh kind of fakes out or or basically uh fakes out the the hardware so the hypervisor is essentially saying hey you need to make this call to to this underlying hardware or this underlying operating system resource. I'm going to figure out what you're trying to call, and I'm going to translate that down to the actual hardware system and and basically reroute all of your calls. So the hypervisor is kind of like this cool mapping layer that sits on top of the real operating system. And then it basically supports these things called virtual machines that now have this ability to call down to anything that it's any resource that it needs from the you know, a network resource or a, or actually writing to a drive somewhere like hypervisor is the actual thing that's going to map it from the uh, operating system call within the virtual machine out to the operating system call in the real machine, right? Yeah, so, exactly. So it, it like a hypervisor essentially pretends to the operating system that there is a certain hardware present. Yep. Right, like when you when you use a virtual machine, you can still obviously do that today, and lots of people very successfully also do that today. Like yeah. if you want to run like say Linux on a Mac or whatever, yeah. or and try different Linux distributions, you fire a virtual machine or something like VirtualBox, a free virtual machine system. And when you when you look at that, you'll notice when you configure it, you can configure how much memory does that VM get. What's the graphics card we, we are emulating? Even though that's a completely different graphics card in your actual computer, right? Or yeah. what, what's the network card? How many network ports are there? So it literally, the hypervisor completely pretends that there's something there and it don't isolates the different uh, virtual machines, gives them certain resources, and also makes sure that one virtual machine doesn't overlap with the other and yeah. that in each other's way, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. So then, you know, that takes care of that weird issue I was talking about before, right? Where anything that, let's say we have one of those apps that starts doing weird, funky things. And let's say the, the virtual machine on this diagram to the left, and they screw up something in that virtual machine, that crazy mishap, crazy stuff that's happening in that virtual machine doesn't affect the virtual machine on the left side. So let's say that one app is just doing some stupid stuff. You, you deployed some, let's let's say you just deployed some, you know, unintentional bad code that, that memory does memory leak, whatever, right? Or a memory leak or something. And it just eats up all the memory in, in virtual machine on the left. Now, uh, that that virtual machine crashes just due to an, an OOM or some some out of memory issue, right? And, uh, uh, and then the virtual machine on the right though, that one's still doing everything. It knows nothing about this crash. It knows has no problems. And those two applications that it's supporting there are, are running just fine. So, you know, in a hypothetical world where, where you have some sort of load balancer that sits on top of these, let's say these are two virtual machines that have the same application. If one of them goes down, then you can go to that other virtual machine still. You can route request to that virtual machine that's still up while the the one on the left that crashed can can you know restart and boot back up and from the customer or user perspective they just never notice anything's down so this yeah, new yeah. paradigm of virtual deployment is not only faster like we, we said you know you usually have to in order to get a, a new resources you have to go through all of this red tape and craziness just to get it up now you can deploy faster you anything that that fails on a, on any of these systems, you know, that crash, they they go down and, and it's totally isolated from all the other applications. It only affects the things inside of one virtual machine. So this was super, super cool. Like we're, we're good, right? Like, well, I, I yes and no, right? Like, I mean, and that's what's <laughs> like, that's what's happening now. Like, um, 
and it's very common, right? Like you can like any hosting environment when you rent a server or whatever, that's what you're actually getting. You're not getting a hardware anymore these days, like mm -hmm. unless you specifically go for that. And like, but the, the normal thing is you get a virtual machine on some big big machine where there's like dozens or hundreds of those running. Yeah. Um, of course, now when it comes to the timing aspect getting a new virtual machine running is much easier, right? Like, because the infrastructure, that hardware is already in place. You yeah. just start a new virtual machine. It's much better. So rather than months or whatever, until you get that, it can be minutes or whatever, like, or yeah. like whatever, like, but each one of those still takes, as I said, at least a couple of minutes or whatever to start up because it has a separate operating system. It has to get its kernel or whatever up and running. It has to mount, the right memory, register the various hardware thing is, even though they only pretend hardware, but it has to register them. So yeah. for your app to start up, it still takes, you know, a minute, two minutes until that is up. I mean, you have to basically boot a whole operating system just to restart an app, right? Like exactly. Each and, each one of those VMs has a full operating system in it. And, and getting back to the disaster scenario we were just talking about, you know, what happens when these crash again? Well, then you have to wait, you know, the same amount of time it took to start it up. You're basically rebooting the operating system and starting that virtual machine back up from scratch like you were before. And that's, again, taking minutes. And, you know, now minutes in, in today's world of te in technology and stuff, that's that's really, really crucial. And, and in, in terms of any type of downtime, I mean, we're, we're talking we, we talk in terms of downtime trying to minimize seconds these days, you know what I mean? Yeah. So so this this is really a much more expensive route, even though, you know, you can you can argue sometimes there are still good reasons why you want to use a virtualized deployment environment like this versus what we're about to talk about, which is the container deployment. So getting to the container, what this did is this basically said, OK, what if we did the similar kind of thing that the hypervisor was doing where we're 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 actually utilizing uh like mapping things but we're what we let's change what we're mapping we're, we're still going to be why don't we instead just share the resources of the underlying operating system and then you go but wait we didn't isn't this what we did in the traditional appointment where we're sharing all these resources and it got us in all these bad situations well this just applies the whole the, the kind of best of both worlds what container uh, runtimes can do is they can actually uh, on a particular, and this is very uh, clear the thing that we should say is that on Unix and, and particularly like Linux operating systems, Linux op, uh, offers this capability to provide isolation within uh, one single operating system. So you have this concept of like namespaces where any process that's created or any any resource that's really used gets assigned to a particular namespace and you say, okay, Anything that's that's happening, uh, any request that happens under this namespace, that is like logically, it's still physically calling the same operating system resource, but logically it's separate. So if something bad happens in one namespace, in one kind of isolated container, that is still gonna be isolated from anything else that happens, but it's just using the same operating system resource that that uh, to, to provide all of the facilities that the hardware and the operating system can provide. So containers essentially give you everything that the virtualized deployment gave you without the need to actually scale out these operating systems and restart them and, and do all this extra stuff. So it ends up being much faster to restart uh, and and uh, and basically uh, much less resource intensive as well to actually you know another thing we didn't really talk about with the virtual machines they take up a lot of extra resources uh, for for the hypervisor and, and all these operating systems those calls are, are very expensive as well uh, mm -hmm. during runtime so so these this uh, new way of doing it is like taking all it keeps all of the benefits of isolation. Um, but it, for the most part, but it really removes a lot of the extra time it takes to uh, deploy or, or basically reboot, you know, your own operating system. So, um, but with containers, one of the kind of, uh, you know, specific things and, and the kind of asterisks that we need to put on the bottom is operating system has to be Linux because that is the, um, or, or anything that really technically supports some sort of uh, this these isolation facilities. And for the most part, you know, in, in practice, that's that's a Linux operating system of some sort. Um, yeah, historically, like it's, it's kind of funny, right? Because um, this isolation on the operating system level is not really actually new. It just really became uh, like very, like what Docker did, and then now with Linux containers, uh, 
what it really did is it made this concept of the isolation of the operating system something that is uh ready for the masses basically everyone can use this like if you're looking back historically there was solaris zones that did exactly the same thing and then back yeah. even on the old main like mainframe computers you had that kind of isolation but it was yeah. not usable for anyone now I everyone can use it and with using these containers you can basically pack more applications and that's actually like as a, as a developer that's what you care of you want to run and, and also as an operator you want to run lots and lots of applications that's what you want to pay for that's where the business value is you don't care about running an operating system and if that swallows resources that for all intents and purposes that's a waste so with running containers you can basically get more bang for your buck you get more applications running on the same server hardware and that's super important yeah and this actually motivates kind of the this whole concept of going from the monolith to a microservice uh, along the same around the time uh you know we were trying to take these kind of old uh, what we when we say a monolith we have all of these different um you know functionalities and pieces to let's say a legacy application that you know, has every single piece of functionality to uh, some application that it, let's say that you're selling as a vendor, right? Yeah. And so you have everything that that gets packed together in this kind of web server, and that was that was how it was back then. But microservices were and kind of in tandem with this whole uh, ability to pack in all of these things on a single node or or at least a couple nodes. Um, you know, being able to distribute this and do this much more in parallel. Uh, really gave rise to this microservices architecture. And so now you can actually start taking these these uh, apps, these legacy apps that are all clumped up together and you start piecing out little little sections of that of that uh, you know kind of monolith, that big application and you can actually make it a smaller application so that all of these little applications are still doing the same work and the same job that that original app, legacy app was doing. But now you can do it in a much more uh, modularized way so that if one thing goes down, it's not actually taking down the entire system, you know, in a monolith way, if, if one thing went down, it was basically the whole application was shot. You had to wait to restart it and get it up back up and running in this microservices architecture. Uh, ideally, there's there's, you know, as long as certain critical pieces don't totally go down, you know, like load balancers or things like that, um, you know, and, and typically your load balancers will have load balancers. It's kind of like yeah. that exhibit meet. Uh, I heard you like load balancers, so I got you load balancers for your load balancers. <laughs> um, so as long as you have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, fault tolerance and things in mind about to, to kind of back you up there, you know, uh, you can scale out these these type of systems, you know, in this particular uh, diagram, we see multiple backend uh, and multiple frontend uh, applications getting deployed over two nodes. And, and this is actually, you know, showing it on the cloud in a, in a Google uh, Kubernetes engine. But, you know, you could technically see a load balancer that needs to talk to a front end service and a back end service. It just knows it's talking to a front end service, but internal to Kubernetes, it will end up routing you to a specific instance of that. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself with this diagram, but this is kind of the concept. You can have multiple instances of the uh, the same app uh, spread across nodes so that if that node goes down, you have one version of it on the other node. And or if that just instance goes down, you have multiple uh, instance applications that you can back up on. So, so this is kind of getting into this really, you know, when we start looking at microservices, we really started to have a, an issue uh, that we ran into where, okay, this is great that we have this capability now, but how do you manage all of this crazy complexity of this service layers being able to get deployed on multiple nodes and multiple instances and all of this stuff? And, and then you have to put a load balancer and make sure that load balancer knows what the uh, services are and the addresses are and all these things. Like, how do you manage all of that craziness? And yeah. so we went through all of that diagram basically to say, this is what Kubernetes solves. This is actually uh, now that we, uh, you understand kind of the deployment uh, issues that you might face or, or the kind of things you might want to do with with containers. This is exactly where Kubernetes started to, to gain popularity and and, uh, and really gain momentum. So, well, um, let me just go back to the microservices. An, an important sure. aspect um, that I think uh, is often overlooked is why this even came up to some degree, right? Like, sure. The reason uh, it ended up uh, going towards breaking up the applications was also just 
out of sheer complexity. These large yeah. legacy applications were so big that no developer could like easily understand or like understand what is even going on in all the different parts. Yeah. And so many developers needed to work on the same application, the same code base, and then merging and like just managing the change gets so complicated and everything is so much tangled together that it becomes not feasible to to like write this application and then you end up with these large legacy applications where you do one change and it breaks something completely unrelated where you're like what is going on right so yep. it becomes unmanageable with microservices you can also break up the application so that many more developers work on it and basically make a better application in the end it's just broken up into many pieces and more complex the fact there is then, of course, you have many, many pieces. And yeah. with all those containers, <laughs> you need yeah. to manage those. And that's why you need Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is what what's called a container orchestration platform, right? Yeah. Like you have all these containers, they do all these things. Something needs to manage what's going on with them. And you sure don't want to do that manually. And that's yep. what Kubernetes solves. Yeah, great, great point there too about giving a little more context around the microservices. I kind of glossed over that, but that that's, you know, from a if you think about another motive, big primary motivation is the decoupling and uh, and kind of making sure that when it, you know, making these smaller units and also from a coding standpoint or from a development standpoint you also need to be able to test these things and so if you have these in much smaller units it's much easier to test these smaller modules than it is to just try to figure out these giant integration tests that have to like just throw random bits of data into the big giant monolith machine and figure out how that you know where that goes through the whole uh maze and then comes out somewhere you know and make exactly. sure that that data looks correct it's it's impossible to uh, not impossible but very difficult and and as things got more complicated as you say you know testability was a, was another huge motivation for microservices so great great point and and definitely a good motivation for you know there's a, there's a lot of reasons why microservices became popular and now there's kind of like you know i think we there you're kind of seeing the teeter tottering of the spectrum, right? Everybody said hell no to you know uh, uh, these these bigger bigger uh, processes. Keep it as modular as possible. I think we're swinging a little bit back in the other way. I don't think we're going to go to full. Well, modular it's again. always you know like a, a healthy medium. Yeah, uh, a bit that adjusts to the the specific domain. And well, yep. when we talk about Trino well, later, we'll see that it sort of all sits somewhere in the middle there. It always depends, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's always the right answer. Um, so, so then now we've kind of motivated Kubernetes. Uh, let's talk into a little bit about these components that that make this work. Uh, you know, it's going to be good. They're the I, I find it overwhelming, uh, you know. And this is I'm still I also very fresh to Kubernetes, and so I have this like feeling like when I when I look through the what is Kubernetes and how to uh, you know look understand the components, it's a lot of pieces, a lot of running working pieces that you have to kind of uh, get your head around. And I feel like sometimes, you know, they uh, Kubernetes, maybe necessarily so, I, I don't know at this point, uh, you know, they, they kind of try to do the whole Carl Sagan approach where they try to build the whole universe first and then get you started. Um, <laughs> and, and it's maybe maybe that's a necessary evil with this thing because it is a complicated uh, set of, of things and you need to have the vocabulary to understand what they're talking about when they're instructing you. So. I, I wanted to try to do my best thing about like trying to make it as lame in terms as possible. Um, but you know, the, if you want to look at this in a more detail, you know, the, the Kubernetes docs are incredible and they do a good job at breaking it down, but they have to, I guess, include everything. And it's a hard task to kind of make something as complex as Kubernetes uh, digestible. So I think it'll take, you know, definitely get a course. So there's a lot of great courses on Udemy and there's also, you know, um, a lot of good docs and, and free tutorials on Kubernetes that, that'll get you started. And I think just getting your hands on it is the easiest way to actually understand a lot of this stuff. So I'm just gonna preface it with that. But you know, let's go through a couple of these things. So you know, obviously we have this concept of a node. So that's like either a, a physical machine or a VM that's that's running these little cubelets, uh, and, and ultimately those cubelets are are kind of the pieces that that join me into this this cluster. And so you know, the cubelets will talk to this control plane. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll get to that more specifics on that in a second. But they talk to this control plane, and that's the thing that's actually monitoring all all the nodes that exist and and what space is available and all this other stuff. And so we'll talk about that here in a second. But, you know, 
the basic concept is a node, and then the cluster is you know all of these nodes connecting to this control plane to to join the Kubernetes cluster. Very similar to the coordinator worker type setup. Any of these leader follower type type uh, uh, setups. You know when you when you talk about distributed stuff. Um, so so node and cluster, and then the instances. We, we were talking about instances of applications before. Uh, Kubernetes term for that is is, po is a pod. They like to have these things as a pod. And a, what a pod does is it uh, it is a definition that uh, that they execute on uh, uh, through various you know different objects. And they basically uh, have these definitions specified in a YAML file. And when they run a pod or when they create a pod, it's basically creating uh, an instance of your application. And so that's kind of like the the small smallest unit in a in a Kubernetes uh, ecosystem is is these dealing with these pods. And so you know you might move pods back and forth on the nodes. You might have multiple. You'll definitely have, or I mean, I can't say one hundred percent, but most likely, you're if you're deploying more than one app uh, that that will run on more than one node, you you'll likely de deploy uh, multiple pods. So back in our microservices architecture, these front end apps here, these are all basically pods. Uh, for, of different applications, you know, the back-end applications, and then this is, you know, multiple instances of the front-end application. Yeah, and so, tying that back, tying yeah. that back to the containers, sure. typically on that pod, you run one container that is your application. Um, yeah. Th but the lowest, it's the smallest unit because what often happens is you have additional containers sort of running that are associated. Yeah. Everything in a everything in a, in a pod can talk to each other. So if there's like multiple container, they can talk to each other via sort of local host HTTP yeah. address. So they know of each other. Um, and that's why that's the smallest unit. Typically these kind of additional containers are like for metrics or whatever else. Like yeah. is, they're called sidecar containers often. I've also heard them called helpers. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, the, the, you, you typically have is like maybe one's going to be if you have like this concept, let's say of a front end app, it, there, you're going to have one container that's like let's say Nginx or or some sort of you know web app server or something that has like a that exposes a port that you know people interact with either through REST or some API, right? And then that that gets exposed, and then there's other containers that maybe do different you know functionalities or or tasks within that, but primarily uh, in average, you know, there's, there's going to be maybe one uh, app that's, that's exposing itself as a service uh, uh, within that yeah. thing. And so, you know, port 80 for web services and maybe all these other ports for, you know, like 8080 for Trino, for instance. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so then if we get into the control plane, you know, there's, there's four, pri you know, it shows five up here. Uh, there's, there's two that are kind of, I would say somewhat duplicated for, for the beginner purposes. Um, so I'll say, you know, the API server is the first thing you want to understand. The API server is kind of the connection points for all the kubelets. Uh, and it's kind of the, you know, that's, that's one first thing. It also, you know, has the front end for any, any time that a user wants to go in and look around at things, you can actually it expose to some front end or anything that uh, any kind of CLI thing that, that interacts with Kubernetes always talks to the API. So, so in particular, yeah, like when uh, you talk to the, when, when you use Kubernetes, yeah, you are basically always talking to the uh, API and yeah. you use kubectl, which is yep. a command line tool, or you use like octant or lens or whatever. There's like a hundred of them that basically all abstract the API and it's a very powerful API. It's very stable uh, yep. and basically yeah. has endpoints for all sorts of things. And I think it's all open, right? So like technically, you know, yeah, yeah, it's part of the spec. yeah, so they, every, every, every like kind of spec around these things are, are, are all open and and everybody else can implement their own version of it. But I think Kubernetes is the most adopted one anyway, so uh, in terms of the actual instance. So API server, you know, it does a lot of things in terms of connecting the nodes, but also connects you as a user to, to talk to it through kubectl. And we'll go through an example of that today. Um, I got to actually speed this up so that we can get to the demo. I have a hard cut off at the top of the hour. So, um, so etcd key store. That's taking a lot of this stuff that we'll show you here in a second is going to take a lot of the uh, settings that we pull in through YAML and store a lot of that uh, locally. So that's just basically a distributed store. It's, think about if you're familiar with Zookeeper, it's very similar to a Zookeeper type key store. 
Uh, it's just the one that, that happens to be used within a Kubernetes uh, um, in infrastructure. Um, scheduler, you know, maybe this is very obvious, but it's the, it's the kind of piece that uh, is, is uh, figuring out what node it goes to, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's funny how there's a lot of like parallels between the, like Trino, how, how Trino has these, all, all these things and they just- we, It's we all about it, managing uh, all, like, the cost of All about managing distributed stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so scheduler just distributes the works across the nodes. It, it figures out, hey, you know, this one went down on this node or maybe this whole node went down. We need to re reschedule these these pods on on different nodes now or we have a new node let's let's redistribute it and make sure that we you know we, we get everything uh, equally distributed as much as possible and so a scheduler is, is in charge of all that and then you have the controllers so there's two that they show in this diagram one's the cloud controller manager and one's just the controller manager for local um, there are probably I think there's just extra facilities that live in the cloud manager. I haven't looked too too heavy into that. It even says optional here. Uh, I imagine that there's th this one deals with a lot of the logic of basically being able to uh, to to do specific facilities on Azure, or AWS. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Do you, are you familiar with? Yeah, yeah, and, and like I mean, this is a whole different ball game. Like running a Kubernetes cluster is one thing. As a normal user, you just need to interact with the API and you let the infrastructure people deal with like operating the cluster, right? So, um, uh, and typically that's also in the cloud, right? Like there's like Amazon and Microsoft and Google and they all, all these cloud providers have basically like where you, all you need to really know is they offer and stand you up a Kubernetes cluster yeah. and then you work with it. And when you work with it, you use those tools that basically talk to it via the API. Yeah. Like once you know the tools for Kubernetes, even local, and, and there's, I think a one, there's a cloud admin one that you may have to learn or something, but like the, outside of like the one extra one they have to learn when you actually go out on the cloud, which we'll be talking about in a future episode on this, um, you'll, uh, you'll basically uh, be, you know, once you learn the, the main API and the interactions the first time, it kind of mostly like uh, will, will apply to deploying it out on the cloud. So it's nice, one nice abstraction awesome, that yeah. you learn, and then it go it applies to every cloud thing. So once you get up and running locally and you get this thing, you know, the, these concepts down, you can re redeploy these things across all these different clouds. Um, so uh, moving along, uh, you know, each worker will have a container runtime. So, you know, this could be something like Docker that maybe you're more familiar with, but in particular, Kubernetes has its own, uh, what's it called, Manfred? It's like it a, just uses Linux containers directly. Oh, it just uses the, okay, yeah. So it just directly uses the Linux containers and doesn't actually rely on the Docker runtime or anything like that, or can, I think, but it, it just generally doesn't uh, out of the box. Um, you have, as I was mentioning before, you have the kubelet. Uh, that's the little, you know, kind of uh, agent guy that's sitting on all the different nodes and talking to the API and saying, hey, I'm still alive. Hey, I'm still running all these things. Um, and then, you know, another one is uh, the kube proxy. Mm -hmm. That's getting into facilitating a lot of the network stuff across nodes. Uh, you know, as Manfred said, when you're when you're in a pod, you can talk within the same network because you're hypothetically, I guess, kind of like in the same virtual environment. But then when you are uh, when you have to talk to, let's say, an API that's on another node. So let's say, you know, node one to node two, you actually have to go over a network at some point. So there has to be a way to kind of map between the, the local virtualization out to another node's local virtualization and be able to to talk to the, that API. So, yeah, so everything, everything like most of the interaction in within is within the cluster and stuff happens over HTTP protocols or TCP IP, like HTTP mostly. Um, and like what Q proxy and kubelet and the container run and what they also look after is things like that a container is actually running. And yeah. so a container has something called a liveness and the readiness probe and stuff. So they expose a HTTP endpoint that says I'm up and running and I'm fine. Yeah. Right? And, and that's con and the container run then manages if and pings that endpoint all the time. And if the container doesn't answer within a certain time, it'll kick it out and start a new one and all those kind of things. So the container orchestration platform as such, and that takes care of all these things. And that's the all the infrastructure for that is these different pieces. So, you know, a lot more to dig into there. And definitely I've, I've sent out some of the sources in the show notes of like where you can find some of this, this information on Kubernetes sites, as well as others. But, you know, the real question is, okay, you know, I, maybe you've, you've got an inkling for this or maybe you already use Kubernetes, but I really want to make this clear about like, how does this relate to Trino and how does this help us out, right? 
So why not just use Docker Compose? I have like this whole other repository that I've linked you to on previous episodes that we we just use Docker Compose and it gets things up. But uh, you know, one issue, I mean, I'll just get it straight to it. You know, the issue is that Docker Compose um, is is basically allowing you to do what what Kubernetes does inside of that single pod. You can run a local environment that that essentially brings up multiple containers that talk to each other. But if you want to deploy this across multiple nodes and scale this out, you know, across let's say uh, different even even different cloud providers uh, and things like that, and scale it out to you know nodes or or uh, within those cloud providers, you have to use something that has, does container orchestration hands down. And so, you know, Docker Compose is good for prototyping and getting things, you know, conceptually working to begin with and just running a, a simple thing locally. But once you want to actually get things deployed out in a full like cloud environment or even on a local environment that, that you know, you're running your own local Kubernetes cluster, um, you know, the, and, and simplifying that deployment aspect across nodes, you need to use uh, something like a, like this orchestration uh, platform. Yeah, because like Docker Compose, for example, if you fire up Docker Compose and it starts a couple of containers and then you go into your Docker runtime and kill a container, that's it. Like it's not gonna automatically start it again. It's not gonna do any HTTP routing or anything for you. Yeah. Kubernetes does all that. So, you know, out of the box, Kubernetes gives you things like being able to scale up and scale down manually and being able to like, you know, start up and kill all of these uh, uh, kind of pods. Uh, you can do failover pretty well. Like if something dies, uh, it's monitoring that uh, with these kubelets like Manfred mentioned before. And it basically says, oh, this thing died. We need to pull it up uh, and get another instance going somewhere else. Um, on a more advanced note, what we could do eventually with Trino are, you know, is this auto scaling concept. We what if what if we want to based on some parameters or some things like how many requests we're getting, we want to actually scale up or scale down, uh, you know, uh, Trino, uh, the amount of worker nodes that we have. So this gets a little more complicated. Out of the box, right now, is what we have uh, in uh, in the open source. Uh, we have this thing called a Helm chart, which we'll talk about in the next slide, uh, bullet. Uh, we have this thing that basically does not have any of this auto scaling capability yet, and that's because it's a little bit, you know, it's a little tricky to to, to uh, do. And we also are trying to think of like what's the right way to do this as well. Um, that 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 meets most of the needs of, of the of the community. So you know, this is I, I linked you to the thing that does this this horizontal pod autoscaler, and it pulls in these. You know, you can do existing metrics on the on you know maybe how many times you're hitting an endpoint, or you can do custom metrics and all sorts of cool things there. Um, but it takes a lot of you know learning about this and how to scale it up. And then this other concept that I wanted to dive into a little bit here, but I got to go through pretty quickly is graceful shutdowns. So you can get into this kind of thing where uh, when you shut down a, a pod, um, there are two uh, simultaneous things that occur. On the API server, you actually uh, shut down the, the, the uh, availability on the queue proxy, which tells you to forward to uh, one of the forward to the correct pod. But then you also on the local side of the of the node, it tells the API server tells the uh, kubelet on that node to start exiting. And what you can do on accident or, or what can happen basically because these two occur asynchronously is that you can exit the process before it stop. It's actually the, the mapping in the queue proxy goes away. So the API server might, you know, take in a request forward it to that uh, that that um, that eight that's basically that cubelet or that pod that was already deleted and now all of a sudden oh you, you're getting this like not available thing and it can be kind of confusing when you do this uh, you know when you're starting up and shutting down these processes all day when you, you kind of doing this auto scaling feature so graceful shutdown what it's trying to do is basically make the the uh, this extended period where you either can just do something as simple as wait for it us waits properly for, until the queries yeah. are finished or whatever yeah yep and then that way this whole uh, queue proxy removes the entry and doesn't keep forwarding things to that uh, to that cubelet uh, or that that pod basically and then you know eventually you'll you'll remove that uh, capability there and it's gonna route it to a different pod and then at this point the the um, graceful shutdown eventually stops and actually finally kills that uh, um, that uh, that that pod so 
let's l cover the one last thing we need to do before we hop into uh, the Helm chart and, um, or sorry, before we hop into the PR of the week. Um, what the heck are Helm charts? <laughs> so, so we'll, I think the best thing to do is to really cover this by example, which we're going to do in the demo. But, uh, you know, basically the Helm, Helm chart is a way there's this to actually do a lot of things that you do with, with Kubernetes, you do it through a whole bunch of YAML files. And we're going to cover that in the demo file, a little taste of that in the demo file, uh, or sorry, in the demo that I'm going to do just now. But basically the, the Helm chart uh, is, is taking all of these things, all of these, like, you know, uh, um, these, uh, uh, let's say configurations and basically uh, templatizing them and making them to, to where you can just provide a couple of values. And what the Helm chart's gonna do is based on the inputs of these values, it will generate all of the, uh, the, the, um, the manifest, uh, the manifest and all of the different uh, YAML files that basically configure and tell Kubernetes how to stand up all these different, uh, all these different pods and, and, and pieces within your, uh, within your, it's often um, called sure. like a package manager for yeah. Kubernetes, essentially. So just like you would install an application on, on, on Ubuntu or so with app to a, with RPM on, on Fedora or so, yeah. it does that for Kubernetes. It makes yep. it super easy to get an application up and running. That's a good way. So so I'll, I'll leave it at that because we got to get moving on. But, uh, you know, without further ado, let's go on to the PR of the week. Uh, much less smooth, but uh, I am trying to move along so we can get to this demo. Um, so this one, uh, PR of the week, is still open. Uh, it's still a work in progress, and we're still thinking about it. But um, basically, this is taking one of the Helm charts that was contributed by uh, Valeriano Manacero. Uh, he uh, basically had this this uh, Helm chart well before we had a community, uh, uh, an official community Helm chart. And so uh, it, it gained a lot of popularity. It had a lot of, you know, already a little bit of community uh, community folks using it and uh, saying that it's it's pretty good. Uh, I don't know the specifics. I, I I wanted to actually pull through some of the specifics of different changes. But if you're if you're savvy on on some of the things that uh, uh, you know are, are kind of going on in the uh, open source Helm chart already, you might be able to take a look at this pull request and kind of see some of the things that uh, that he had changed. Um, and I think the idea right now is that we think this is all a good way to move, but we're waiting for this to be done in more smaller modules. So I think uh, we're we're kind of hoping that at some point, and I want to get Valeriano on one of these Kubernetes talks in the future. I want to try to get uh, him to kind of talk about, uh, you know, his initial setup and, and things like that, and uh, and see how if he can start breaking those down into smaller, you know, chunks, so that we're not changing like a whole bunch in the charts that we have already, and then get those slowly into in, integrated in, so that we can see, oh, okay, we added this at this point, and we added this for this reason, and it has a whole, you know, kind of slow standard approach that we like to take. So, so we understand why these changes or things were, were added. Um, and, and, you know, we could talk around that and commit messages. So I uh, just wanted to make a point out to this, and I'm really excited about this getting uh, eventually merged into the, the primary Helm chart. Uh, there's still a lot of things that we want. There's a lot of things to be wanted uh, from the Helm chart, but it, it does get you up and running today. And we, we're going to go over that here in the uh, demo of the week. But just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, getting this started Valeriano and and uh, also you know agreeing to kind of contribute your version into the uh, the the um, the uh, uh, the community version. So thanks so much for that. And with that, now on to the demo. So um, as you can tell, we need to get this thing going because I I do have a bit of a hard cut off. But uh, what you'll need to do for this demo. I have some links here in the show notes. We want to install kubectl. This is that uh, CLI command uh, that uh, Manfred was talking about. So uh, we want to install kubectl. Actually, while I talk about this, I'm going to start up this other thing that you'll need to install called minikube. We'll get that one started up um, and uh, while well, we're talking about that. Minikube uh, is just a Kubernetes cluster, mini, yeah. like a very small one in a box that you can run on your one machine. Basically. Yep, and what's really funny about this one is you can <coughs> use a driver. It's, you'll see this Minikube start, and then uh, you can install Minikube locally or you can have different drivers. And since I already have Docker <laughs> installed locally, I don't want to have to install a whole separate Minikube thing. So I actually run Kubernetes on 
Docker. So, and this is fine for a small local thing just to try things out. Uh, but I, you know, definitely don't do anything like this in a, I, I would not recommend this for like a real production setup. Um, uh -huh. So, uh, so, but, but, but for playing around, this is perfectly fine. And so if you can kind of see, uh, let me minimize this. Uh, this is just so you have, get a Linux container going, basically, yep, because you basically un get ultimately you need to have Linux running and you're on a Mac, and that's what this does. Exactly. So we get Minikube started. It's still creating the, the uh, container inside of the of Minikube right now. Um, and what we're going to basically do is we're going to use kubectl, uh, and first we're going to uh, basically get all of the uh, current things running on on our Kubernetes cluster. So this get command basically just uh, uh, enumerates all of the services, all of these different objects, and, and these are things that um, you know are are uh, pieces that you'll. I will unfortunately have to defer you to the Kubernetes uh, stuff for this show. Uh, we can maybe dive into it a little more next time. But there are these objects that are um, are available and. Kubernetes that you have to set up. So one of them is that we're going to talk about today is config map. This is how we're going to basically set up our catalogs. Um, so we, you could see one, some of the catalogs here is our TPCH properties, TPCDS properties. That's one object that we're going to set up, as well as all the configurations for our coordinator. So this has our JVM config, our node properties. These should be pretty familiar to you if you've actually installed Trino before. If you haven't installed Trino before, this this uh, is basically the configurations that drive setting up a Trino uh, cluster. Then we have another kind, uh, and this is how we specify the type of object called a service. This is the piece uh, as we had kind of seen up here. Whenever we had these these applications, we have this this load balancer that sits on tops, and it goes to a service. Now the service will know. Uh, all of the different instances of that service that exists and will point you to different uh, instances or different pods uh, on the back end. And it does a lot of that, that piece for you. So that's what this service object is actually uh, doing for you, is it's uh, exporting this, this port 8080 that we have uh, on, on uh, Kubernetes. Now, and that's internally, you actually have to do some a little bit of magic to get it to map to 8080 on the outside, which we won't be doing today. We also have this deployment. This is the one that actually pulls together all of the configs and all of the uh, different uh, Trino uh, mounting paths. So basically setting up all of the, uh, where we actually map those configs, the ports that get exposed from these deployments and all that, all that, all that jazz. So this is how we're gonna do it just through kubectl. And these are typically files. You can see this is a file, but I'm just basically uh, cheating and putting all the files uh, here, right here in in this uh, piece here. So let's go to our let's go to first look at kubectl get all and see all of the services and everything and the config files that are uh, running now on our com uh, Kubernetes cluster. And so far, we just have the local Kubernetes cluster running by itself. So that's all that's that's going right now. And we'll see a lot more when we actually apply all of these configs and all of the um, coordinators. Let's Basically, the API is up, which means we can talk to it, which is what we do. Yep. So we're adding these configs. So the API is up and the kubectl is now sending all of these configs to and, and all of the uh, these these um, you know uh, Kubernetes uh, configurations all out to um, the uh, the Kubernetes API server like Man Manfred just mentioned. And we're we're basically just registering all of them. So now we're registering the service. We just we just registered the the configurations. Now let's register the service. This is going to export 8080 uh, for, for Trino. And then finally, we're going to actually do the, the deployment uh, uh, object. And that will deploy. And now, why don't we go ahead and do a, a get all and see what's running on this uh, cluster now. So now we have TCB Trino. Uh, this was based on what I how I labeled it whenever I uh, deployed uh, the names for all these things. And we have a um, the actual pod, which is just the coordinator running. Uh, it's still in the process of creating it. So we have to wait till it's actually up. Uh, so let's see if we can uh, get that status here in a little bit. But while we're waiting for it, and then we also have uh, the, um, the replica set, which is if we were to have said we want multiple coordinators or multiple of different things, we can actually uh, have multiple and, um, and replica set. So it says, this is how many we're, we're saying we want. We just want a single coordinator. And currently we already have that coordinator app up and running. Let's see now if we have still container creating. So, um, 
I, I don't, yeah, I think I can actually start doing this now since the service is created. I can actually export a URL, which is gonna be this temporary URL that's gonna get exposed via Minikube. It's kind of doing an SSH uh, portal. And this is why I, I don't have the capability yet. I, I have to do a couple extra configurations to actually get this to expose um, uh, using 8080. But for right now, I'm just gonna use this temporary uh, 57389 port. So that, so that basically means the port 5738 on your local host Mac maps via Kubernetes to 8080 within yep. the cluster. And it's still not up yet, so we have to wait for this to... We st we're still waiting for um, the uh, actual pod the to, to start up. Come up. There it is. Okay. Oh, there it is. So we, have, uh, we can log into Trino uh, using this. And uh, one other thing I wanted to uh, showcase, now we can... Uh, let's edit this... Um, connection and we'll edit it to this click OK reconnect and so you're sure. using DB were there to connect to it yep. via the so normal JDBC driver but now the coordinator runs in Kubernetes yep so the coordinate we're now connecting to the coordinator that is uh, running by itself and, and uh, running in Kubernetes and we are able to actually run queries against the TPCH data so we have like through Kubernetes now just directly through kubectl we've set up a single active worker which is the coordinator itself and it's able to run uh, queries for us and we did this all through just through Kubernetes and submitted the jobs through kubectl now uh, let's go ahead I'm going to basically clean up the environment uh through um deleting all of these so let's see if i can do this in one fail swoop or if it's gonna do oh yeah yeah there we go all right so now we're gonna do this with helm so what helm's gonna have us do so you deleted the port the lab cassette the service and everything there Correct. and now you're gonna do the same with with helm Cool. Yep. So we want, yeah, we cleared out the old uh, um, Helm, or sorry, we cleared out the old Kubernetes deployment with the one. And now we're going to just do this with Helm. Now, if you look at the Helm charts, let's go ahead and just do a quick gander at, at what Helm charts look like before they actually, um, and actually I want to do. And that's uh, that repository where you looked in GitHub before on the pull request, right? Correct. Uh, GitHub, and then we, I want uh, Trino DB. And instead of Trino, we're going to go to Charts. In charts, we can actually look at some of these. And if you look at these, these are just templates that create a lot of the stuff that we... So if you look at the deployment that we had before, this is now just templatized. And we have a default set of values um, that, that are going to get filled in for these templates. So if you go to the Chart YAML, this has some default versioning stuff that, we're, that we have set up. And if you go into the actual values themselves, the, we're basically saying we want two workers, we want a coordinator, of course, and uh, and here's all the stuff around the service that is going to get filled in to the uh, the um, templatized version of Helm. And all of that happens. Uh, what I'm first going to do is I want to add that chart to our uh, set of repositories that we that we recognize in Helm. So we want to actually point to the that uh, chart um, that chart specific or that chart URL and add that repo into uh, our Helm, and then uh, we also we then want to uh, we can from that point run this template command. And what this is going to do is it's going to show you all of those. Uh, it's going to show you all of the uh, things that it that Helm's going to generate for you based on those uh, inputs that I just showed you. So we have replicas too. We have this is for the worker. And then you can see for the coordinator, we have replicas. Uh, actually, I don't know if they're the replica. Yeah, replicas just doesn't get added for this one because it's just a single coordinator. And so all of these things get generated uh, for you when you do this template. Now, this didn't actually run the install. We actually have to run install to do that. But this is kind of a nice way to say, OK, how are my templates looking? Do they look correct? OK, great. Now I can actually do the install here. And again, these were all the same things that I had pushed before with kubectl. But now Helm just does it all for me. So it's now actually going to uh, to run all this stuff. And uh, and in the same way, I can uh, I can use, it got named the same uh, exact thing, TCB Trino. And now I can actually run that URL there. And again, it's probably still going to take it a bit just to get this uh, up and running. So let's go 
And that templating, by the way, is all uh, Go templating because Kubernetes and also Helm and most other tools in that ecosystem are written in Go, which also explains why the Go programming language has been getting much more popular in recent years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, not all, yeah, Go also came out of Google. So, and, yes. I mean, you just, the same way that Commander Bun Bun just gets a lot of love, I feel like the Go, the Go Gopher is just the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so... I am, uh, I'm, while I'm waiting for it to start up, I am, uh, let's see, connection reset. Let's refresh one more time. Yeah, it's. Uh, it might not be up yet. Yeah, it's still waiting for it. Oh, there we oh, go. There it is. Reno there. And then let's, uh, I think actually this, this is like a weird thing in, uh, let's see, disconnect. And then we'll connect again just to make sure that it refreshes the. Oh, come on, thing. So one thing to point out here, this as this gets up, uh, now, oh, there you you go. Know, now you got your two workers and your query yep. was running. And so actually, this this is a query that came from D Beaver, not right now. Uh, whenever I was, yep, yeah, that to just get the 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 information up here, and now we can run the same query um, on this one. And this is the one that was now pulled up by Helm. And again, Helm, you didn't have to do all those individual files one by one. You basically um, uh, can can set that up by just clicking the install. And this, there's not a huge thing. It's basically the same query, so it's not exciting. But yeah, now this is actually pulled up the same query. But now we have two workers, and we don't we aren't actually using the coordinator as a worker. So we actually have three instances running out there in Kubernetes land, and we didn't have to actually send all that stuff via kubectl this time so this is really where helm is is helping us out get this trino cluster going and, and so. what it does and the important part of that also is it still creates all those manifests and those finds in kubernetes so yeah. if you wanted to for example uh scale up to four workers all you would do is with kubectl or whatever update that manifest in kubernetes to four replica set boom and it will fire up two more and that's all there is to scaling up, for example. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm a little bit over, but uh, I'm glad that we had we took the time because I I feel like this is going to be a super foundational episode to help anybody get up and running. Uh, we'll have the show notes here posted in a little while, and uh, you know I want people to start playing around with Kubernetes, hopefully, uh, and Trino, and start seeing what you can kind of add to it. Uh, we'll get a little more in the next time we do this. I, I'm not sure exactly when we'll, we'll kind of have these sporadically throughout the next couple of months. And we're gonna just try to uh, dive in a little bit more on you know the specifics of maybe some Kubernetes information as well as like you know how do we improve the the existing Helm charts and how do we deploy to the cloud as other little pieces like this that I think are going to be useful to getting us you know up and running on on Ku, Ku, uh, Trino uh, up and running on on these Kubernetes clusters. So uh, so without further ado, uh, anything else you want to say before we uh, we hop off today, Manfred? No, um, definitely try it out. It's 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 definitely something that's worth learning into and uh, if you don't want to run it on on locally you can also use any of the kubernetes offerings from the cloud providers and do the same thing it's it, it literally works the same way so um that can also help if you don't have a, a laptop that has a lot of memory or whatever <laughs> awesome well see you all in two weeks uh we'll be talking change data capture with uh the debesium folks and uh really looking forward to that episode and uh, we'll see you all there all right, cool. Thanks. Music for the show is from the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Shishtaf Swavikowski. Don't forget to give us a star on the Trino repository at github.com forward slash TrinoDB forward slash Trino. And for more information on future shows and to find show notes, check out trino.io forward slash broadcast.